so we've already uh, introduced you to Gil Davis, so today, uh, Gil, if you'd come forward. And uh, also we have a new participant tonight, uh, his first time visitor, and uh, his name is Michael Pender, and he's identified himself as a constitutional attorney, and is asked to speak in Obamacare, he's a former state and federal prosecutor. Um, his uh, focus has been on international human rights and constitutional law, 20 year federalist, and a supporter of Ken Cuccinelli. Uh, so please welcome him also up to the panel. Come on, come on, come on. Yes, I'm not here. Yep. <laughs> and uh, like I said, uh, most of you already know, but uh, Ron Wilcock is actually the founder of this organization. Uh, so I'd like to do two things. First, uh, recognize him and say thank you for coordinating this event. So if you do recognize him for that, I would appreciate it. And, uh, this portion of the event, so please welcome to the Feels like a real panel. <laughs> no podium, sorry. All right. Before we start going on questions, I got the microphone and I have the death grip, so you know me. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Apologize to the folks that last week couldn't hear this presentation because we couldn't do it at the restaurant. It's just too loud, so we have it again here. Um, I'd like to thank Mark Burke for driving all this way. And for our two new guest speakers, I have a gift. This is a uh, Don't Try to Me pen for each of the, the guests. Uh, to, to honors with their, their wisdom. John already has a lifetime supply of them, so he doesn't need one. So. He doesn't have my $95 in here. <laughs> oh well, sorry about the $95. But John has uh, been very good to step up to the plate for this event and uh, give us this analysis. Uh, really did, uh, how do I say it? I asked him at the last minute. Oh. Who else got asked at the last minute? <laughs> Gil Davis. Okay, so this is the Minuteman Brigade, okay? If you're going to be a part of a political movement, think Minuteman. I know sometimes things are inconvenient, they're far away, struggle. We're trying to get our voice out there. So this kind of stuff, you step up to the plate and use your, your God-given talents to help our country uh, come back on track uh, is, is really meaningful. So, um, with no further ado, I believe that Linda Miller had a question first. Yes. Okay, Linda Miller. And I'll repeat the question if they can't hear it. Okay. A few days ago, they had a 9 to 0 decision, and it affected the EPA and its overreaching um, power. Um, is it possible? by any stretch of the imagination that that decision could be used in, in this argument. Ah, what she asked was the 9-0 recent decision on the EPA's overreach into personal property and uh, essentially saying you couldn't go into court against them. But let's let the lawyers talk. Isn't this the, uh, the one that the uh, West Virginia and the uh, the, the twice uh, twenty two hundred square or twenty two hundred uh, uh, feet of uh, yeah, it was a, a piece of property that the people wanted to do something on. The EPA said they could not go to court; they had to go through administrative procedures, which okay. daily would have cost about as much as the. But I thought property. they were given a license, and then the EPA said no. You. Well, oh, I, I used yeah. to be the director of legal counsel for EPA. <laughs> <laughs> So I know something about this, but I was also a Federalist Society lawyer for 20 years. By the way, this is not a fair question because none of these guys were prepped on EPA. So, no, but, but, so he's going to answer but I, I, I'm happy to answer this. I was a real lawyer before that. I was a homicide prosecutor in Newark, New Jersey, and actually became radicalized in a precursor of the Tea Party when people had the long knives out for Clarence Thomas and didn't realize how many friends and associates Clarence Thomas had. Uh, and not least of which were the alumni of Holy Cross University and the wonderful network they had. But getting back to EPA, uh, the, the Clean Water Act and wetlands case has been perhaps the furthest extension 
of federal jurisdiction under the Commerce Clause. And it's been pushed back in recent decisions. Uh, and I think the good news here is I think it is relevant. And I don't think the Supreme Court would assign an unprecedented three days of oral argument were they not prepared to push back further on the Commerce Clause jurisdiction, uh, at least certain justices there. So I think that's a positive sign uh, that they're devoting this much attention to the unconstitutional uh, mandate. And, and just picking up on the point, you know, it can't be a tax if it is assigned to illegal activity. That's a penalty. It's not a tax. A tax can only be attended to lawful activity that is recognized by the government. So I don't think properly considered the going anywhere on that part. Um, uh, you know, in terms of a tax, because as President Obama himself noted when he announced, it's not a tax. Right. So for once, perhaps, we could take the president at his word <laughs> and, uh, and recognize that at, at, at logic. Um, and so I think, um, you know, so I think that the EPA case is relevant. And it, it, and it also, in the unanimous decision, does have a, 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 a unanimous coalition of the justices recognizing that perhaps they've gone too far with the Commerce Clause jurisdiction. May I tack something on? Um, actually, if you look at the thing as a whole, we lose our freedom, totally. The word is freedom. It's, it has nothing, so little to do with tax or not tax. It's freedom. It's our liberty. It's unconstitutional on that basis alone. So why, why isn't an argument generated or made based on that premise. Oh, I agree, and I think some of the amicus briefs have uh, st uh, striven to drive home that point. Um, and I think that's that's the argument, liberty, uh, that this is an unconstitutional encroachment on personal liberty. And yet, the other side is doing everything they can to uh, cast this in terms of benefits and entitlement to people that they don't want to see rescinded. Uh, and so I think that's that's the crux of the argument, how well uh, the advocates are able to articulate the connection between individual liberty and uh, and vitiate the, the Commerce Clause encroachment on that over the years. So I'm encouraged by the fact that the justices have assigned three days to this. And also, I just know one thing, George Will wrote an interesting column in today's Washington Post uh, emphasizing one a curate brief, amicus curate brief, that not only is this an affront to constitutional, uh, the Constitution and, and personal liberty, but it's an affront to the concept of contract law, mm -hmm. where you can't have a contract between individual parties freely joined if the government is requiring them. Mm -hmm. That's coercive, and it's not consistent with the contract as we have understood that since the days of common law. 